Um, my name is Andre Walker. I'm going to talk about running Pro 6 on my Sailfish OS phone. And first of all, I work in this company, Booking.com, and well, they are sponsoring me coming here, and um, they are hiring. So if you want to join Booking, let me know, and um, I can talk you through the process. You probably heard it in other talks as well. Um, so okay, um, this is probably familiar to everybody here. Uh, I, I first started lo using Linux when I was about 13 years old and um, I just want to try it out, uh, no reason specifically, I just heard about it and I want to know what it was like. And so I installed this Brazilian distribution called Kurumin, and this one I guess you didn't heard about, didn't hear about it because yeah, it's Brazilian, not very famous. But anyway, I installed it in my family computer. Back then, we didn't have one computer per pe per person, so I had to dual boot, and otherwise everybody would be mad at me. So I installed this thing, and I I was hooked. I was sold. I was like wow, this is so much nicer, so much cooler. I can, I can customize everything, I can, it's different. So I decided, yeah, I, I don't want to use Windows again, I, I want to use this thing. And there was this adventurous feeling, like um, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, uh, how this, these things worked, and um, there, I didn't know how to program back then, but. I knew, knew how to customize things and change themes and et cetera, so there was a lot more flexibility. And there was all of these, there were all of these um, free software ideas that were linked to it, and it seemed so high and noble and, and correct. And I, I was, I, I started thinking like, I wanna live in a world where things are open source by default, free software and, and proprietary Proprietary software is the odd option, and and uh, yeah, that's that's the world I, I want to live in. Uh, live in, and um, I still had questions whether it was feasible or not. Would programmers earn enough money or not if if every software was free, and um, that sort of questions. And I also never became like a hundred percent fanatic, like. I won't install anything non-free on my computer. I always had like Flash and that sort of things. But I was a teenager and I had this new KDE Linux system and I was breaking things and customizing and learning about free software. So it was all very nice. So 10 years later, I got my first Android phone. And it was Linux as well, it was a Linux kernel and it had some open source components, but it wasn't quite adventurous. It, it didn't feel so customizable and, and I, I couldn't tinker a lot with it unless I rooted it. And by rooting, I, I, mean, I mean exploiting bugs and, and actually breaking it. So it's not really customizable, open, that sort of things. And it didn't have anything of that utopia of GNU that I first learned about, it was just, yeah, it, it, it wasn't the same thing, right? It was still Linux in a way, but not, not quite the same thing. And it, it wasn't what I had in mind when I said I want to live in this kind of world. It wasn't Android I was thinking of. It was kind of boring, just like Windows had been before. So hence, Sailfish OS. This is a Sailfish. Um, I heard about it. I decided, let's try it out. So what is it exactly? Um, so it is Linux again. OK, it's the Linux kernel. And it's based on this mirror. Um, it's like, like a li Linux distribution. And on top of it, they have this Wayland, which probably heard of, it's like the next generation of X11, and it runs Qt5. So it's just a Linux distro, as you can see. And um, 
It also has some proprietary software. It's not 100%, um, but hopefully that's temporary. Uh, and yeah, they have some open source core apps and some closed source uh, core apps. Like the browser is, is based on Gecko and it's open source. It's basically a Firefox. And the, their contacts application, for example, is closed source. But anyway, that's more or less the, the structure of the system. And it's based on this Meagle OS that was created by Nokia and, and Intel. And this is one of the first generation of, of the thing. And then it became this Sailfish OS. And it's maintained by Yola, which was founded by, by ex Nokia employees. Right. So I had this Linux phone, and I had access to a terminal. I didn't have to exploit anything. I, I just had root. I just have to ask for it, and that's it. Uh, install development extensions, and yeah, there you go. Um, I can SSH to it. I, I have a Linux system. So the first a question I asked myself was the same that you would probably ask, which is, does it run Perl? Right. So if you open a terminal and type Perl, it will say command not found. But <laughs> <laughs> you can just pkcon, which is package manager, is a standard package manager. Kcon install Perl. It will get from their repos and install, and there you go. It's basically an RPM. They download it. Uh, now, if you go to their app store, you'll see uh, the, the FAQ, FAQ. You'll see this. Can I submit Perl Ruby, my favorite language applications? No. But feel free to request it. If there is enough interest, we might allow it in the future. Future. And then there's another question. Can I submit Python application? And yes, you can. So that's kind of makes us jealous, right? Um, so I, I didn't think, oh, man, I skipped. Um, yeah, so I didn't think it was fair. So I thought. Uh, maybe I can implement something. Um, I looked it up. Nobody had done any uh, Perl with Perl 5, Qt 5 bindings. There were some old Qt's, uh, 3 and 4. I didn't look it up in detail, so maybe somebody did something, but yeah. Um, I, I searched it and it didn't find anything. And basically what Sailfish requires is is the language and Qt5 bindings, and that's it. It can run, right? So there wasn't Qt5 for Perl yet. I could do it. But then if I'm going to do it, why not Perl6? And Perl6 had two, killers two killer features that made me want to use Perl6 instead of Perl5, right? One is native call. And uh, I guess... I guess this joke has been done before and <laughs> probably won't be the last time. Um, I could do with access, but native call sounds so much cooler. And I heard there are like foreign function interfaces similar to native call in Perl 5 already, but they're not as shiny. And yeah, uh, so Perl 6 looked really appealing because of this. And it sounded very, very easy. I thought, wow, I just got to say is native Qt5 function and it will work. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no. The second feature, parallelism, right? And uh, the current, current, concurrent examples in uh, for Pro 6 that I had seen, the snippets, were really, really nice, really, really beautiful. I thought, wow, this this is going to fit perfectly in, in graphical applications, right? Because GUIs are, by nature, uh, concurrent, right? So if Perl 6 does that well, it's going to be awesome to develop in Perl 6 for Qt5, right? There are, as well, there are options in Perl 5 to um, any event, Coro, I don't know. Um, but Again, not as shiny as Pro 6. And it was basically an excuse to learn more about Pro 6. It was nice. And um, yeah, as I started doing it, I learned that 
it would have been a lot simpler to do in Pro 5 anyway. But uh, I had barely any idea of what I was doing, and I still barely do. Uh, trying to understand how everything works, but anyway. So this, this is how I managed to build it, right? Uh, okay, Sailfish OS has this SDK, and they include this scratch box tool. And it consists of more than these two commands, but I'll talk about these two now. Um, so the first one is basically uh, run this command in a QEMU environment running on user land that is very similar to what we have on the phone so that you can compile things, um, cross-compile things in the SDK, right? And you can compile for the emulator, which is I486, or the ARM phone, right? So you can run uh, this command and it will load the right libraries and yeah, uh, it will mimic a uh, Sailfish OS environment. And the other one is basically a wrapper around SB2 um, that takes a spec file and builds an RPM from it using SB2. So what I should have done is I should have just used MB2. But um, I didn't know how to write RPM spec files. So I read, I started reading the one they had in Sailfish for Pro 5, and it was based on the Red Hat version. And it was dreadful. It was really, really complicated. It, it, oh. uh, it split everything in, in small packages and, and did a bunch of stuff that I didn't understand. So I, I thought, ah, oh, no, this is too complicated. I'll just run the regular Rakuto installer from SB2 and it hopefully will work. Right. So this are the, these are the commands that I ran, right? So I guess you can spot something funny here, right? This thing, this copy. The reason is, since it th the SB2 creates a CH root, kind of, uh, it's not really a CH root, it's just a fake root, and so sometimes when it tries to run, uh, to load a library, it will get from a different folder, et cetera. Uh, so Basically, it couldn't find libmore.so. So I tried to build it, it built, but it, couldn't, it, it died at some point because it couldn't load libmore. Then I copied it to their, the directory they expected, and then <laughs> I just continued the thing and, and it would work. And okay, I built, um, I, I was able to build uh, Rakudo, first for the emulator, so here I have the target. Uh, Sailfish I48, uh, I486, sorry. Um, so this will build for this target. And then there is this mode. So it runs in diver different modes. You can use SDK, build SDK install. The documentation was kind of confusing. There are several modes. I, I just kept trying and erring and, and going again. So yeah, at some point it, it worked. So now that I had the binaries, should I just ask copy to to my phone and try to run it? Maybe, but it felt wrong. So I looked again and I found Fedora spec files for Rakudo. And it was uh, sane compared to Pro 5's spec files uh, for Red Hat. And um, yeah, it, it was fairly recent. Um, it was like uh, 2016, uh, uh, 07, so it's latest version, I, I think. Um, and yeah, I just, I just copied it and um, stripped down things that were a little bit Fedora-ish, and uh, I inlined the third-party libs that Rakudo has in line as well, because Fedora would split them off, which is reasonable for a distribution, but for, for what I wanted to do, I didn't want to build like several RPM files. I just wanted three, not quite Perl, more VM, and Rakudo, and that's it. So okay, I, I managed to get these spec files. I, I 
uh, created them. And first command ran, second ran, third ran. And there you go, I had, I had RPMs for the emulator. Now the not quite Perl uh, was uh, no arc uh, RPM, so it was platform independent. So I didn't have to build it again for, for the phone. Um, so now I wanted to compile to the phone for ARM. The first went fine and the second didn't. And it didn't because QEMU seg faulted. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to debug that, right? Um, so I got a little bit disappointed. And then I decided, well, I got this far, why not finish it on my phone? So I copied the RPMs to my phone. I installed the packages for GCC, make, and everything on my phone using the default repos, nothing magical, just pkcon install, and uh, ran RPM build against my spec file. I didn't have these nicety, niceties things, but uh, RPM build, I could install it, and, and I, I built. It was quite slow, obviously, because ARM isn't very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it built. Uh, and I had Perl 6 on my phone. Um, of course, at this point, it's just CLI. But I could just create a uh, w open Vim in my phone and, and create a Perl 6 source file. and and do anything. Uh, it's quite quite slow, but um, the startup time is is kind of slow. I don't have be benchmarks yet, but anyway. Now, all of this could have been avoided if I just used Pro 5, right? Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is only the building part. Now, binding with Qt. Okay. So the first thing I tried to do was to use the Python, Python version. And um, right, they have this Python project called Pi Other Side. And uh, it's built by a guy called Thomas Pearl. Really, Thomas Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, he made this, this library. And I, I tried to under understand his code and, and made several experiments with it, several test applications, see how it worked, see how the code worked. But then I realized something very obvious that was there from the start, but I, didn't, I hadn't seen, was that he used C++ to call Python, to load libpython or whatever, and execute your file and convert things and, and bring it back. If I wanted to use native call, I would have to go the other way around, right? <laughs> and it I, had, I would have to make Perl load Qt and, and talk with it. OK, so that's bad. And there's another thing that I found at this point was that Qt5 is C++. So native call has a problem with it because C++ has multiple dispatch. So it mangles the symbols. So it's quite hard to, to interface with it. So that's a problem. So I could start from scratch, which I, yeah, I wouldn't know how. <laughs> or I, I actually found something that was a little more similar, which is a Rust binding for Qt5, for QML. It wasn't focused on Sailfish, but, um, but it was Qt. It was QML. Uh, and it was very similar to what Q, um, native call does. And it, has or it had already the wrappers in C to, to make the functions accessible um, via native call. Right. So I, I, I got his project. I adapted to Sailfish OS, ran it in the, the emulator, managed to create a simple application in Rust. And OK, it works. I can convert it to Pro now. Um, and I stripped down everything that wasn't necessary for a proof of concept, because I didn't want to 
copy advanced features or half finished features. So now it's time for the demo. Um, okay, so let's start with a Python example. Um, this is this, yeah, the Python example. Um, so it's kind of hard with the microphone. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so I just started running the, oops, where is it? Let me move to the other window. The other side. Okay, oh, this is small. Oh. Okay, let me see. Uh, scaled, maybe? Okay, thank you, yeah. Um, okay, so the example is this. You have this caller is unknown, you have the button down, and it will call a Python function. So it's faking, it's doing something, and it will say color is red, right? So if I, oops, if I go back to the code, um, this is the Python code, oops. Um, you have this slow function here, which is just with sleep and it will send signals to Qt5, right? And this is how, how it works. Um, okay. The Rust example is this one. So here it will load the QML for you, uh, the, the Qt engine and everything. So it's not called by Qt, it calls Qt. And it will set a function here. Right, which is basically factorial. And the example is here. You can ask me, and then you can say, I want to know factorial of five, and we'll say 120. I don't know if you can read it. Okay, closer, yeah? Okay. So, <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> I think I can hold it, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> of all the ways I imagined this presentation, Larry while holding my phone was not one of that. <laughs> okay, so the last example is, of course, Pro 6. But it's even simpler than the Rust example. So the Rust example, it didn't, did, doesn't have signals, it only exposes functions and it's just because the programmer had trouble and wasn't interested enough so he gave up apparently I don't know um, but yeah he only created the handlers for for signals not the signals themselves and I didn't manage to create even the man the handlers for the signals because it was too complicated I tried very hard until the very last minute but it wasn't working so what I managed to do, and, and it's very elegant in, in the way that Perl 6 allows you to do, is, is this, right? This is my entire Perl 6 code to load the Q, Qt engine and, and do stuff with it, right? So I, I have these functions, and I, they are native, and I, I tell Perl that, and I'm using a class that represents a, a C pointer, so I have the same class in C, and I have normal methods here, and then here in the end you can see that I just call it and it works, right? So let me call it. Um, yeah, so it's very dark, but uh, Thank you. 
Um, yeah, it's it's just a, a demo QT QML file. And yeah, the only thing that I'm trying to demonstrate it is that it can load it and hopefully do stuff with it. Um, the C code oops, is basically copied from the Rust project, but I'll just show you. So uh, this, for example, is the part that it's creating an engine in uh, instantiated the engine in Qt, um, and Sailfish has this thing, which is a, a small wrapper, just to make it control the the, the application. And I'm I'm using a singleton because I, I was just <laughs> I just wanted a proof of concept thing. And yeah, this is exposed in the pro side uh, in the pro six side, and it works. Um, right, so these are the examples. I can I can show you working on my phone later on after the presentation if you're interested. Okay, um, so to close this, why does any of this matter, right? Besides the fun aspect of it, of implementing, implementing this thing in, in my phone. Um, so one of them is Qt5. And while I, I was uh, researching about it and learning about it and, and making it work, I, I, I found that, well, Qt5 uh, boasts about running it everywhere, running everywhere, and it's really impressive that it it runs by default in, in Sailfish OS, BlackBerry, Ubuntu Phone, Plasma, several open source or um, yeah, free software projects that want to push to the mobile phone. Um, they use Qt5 and it claims to also run in Android, iOS, Windows, Linux, Mac, anything. So theoretically, if we have decent Qt5 bindings for Pro 6, we could run really everywhere, like everywhere, even in these weird platforms such as Sailfish. Uh, weird as in not widely used. And well, the other reason why I think it matters is because of Sailfish OS itself. It, it uses a lot of free and op open source software. It, it creates a lot of free and open source software. It has an active community. Uh, there's a lot of pressure for them to op open source everything. And um, it's, it's really nice. It feels awkward every time I, I try to use an Android or iOS phone. It's the way the UX works in, in Sailfish is really nice. Uh, and it has been ported to several devices. So, um, so yeah, what, what I wanted to say is if, if you're also bored with current options in uh, for operate, uh, operating systems and, and mobile phones and you want to try it out, I highly recommend. And if you do, please help create demand for Pro 6 in their store. So maybe one day we can have it there. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. I, s I started, <laughs> yeah, I think more like months, not, not continuously, right? <laughs> but I started before July, maybe in May, June. Yeah. Uh, I started with the April version of Rakuto, and then, um, I start, uh, then I went to the July version. So I know it took a few months, uh, but of hours, I don't know, a, a lot, <laughs> really. Yeah? It does, it has like an option is mangled, but it, n it never managed to get, it, it, it always says like uh, 
couldn't understand the mangling algorithm, some, something like that. So I, I guess it changes from compiler to compiler, so I never managed to get it to work. No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so that's it. <laughs>